so I think all of us would rather have Dave come back and talk for another hour about this fascinating problem. Uh, all except Dave would like that. <laughs> so this talk will be me really as a spokesperson for a large community of people around the world, some of whom are in this room, who have begun to think about a different interpretation of colloidal interactions. Um, colloidal interactions which are um, geometrically very simple, just the same as in Dave's uh, spherical geometry, but where the interactions are directional rather than isotropic. And this is an idea that goes back to Dijen, as so many ideas in our field of soft matter do. This, he conceived the idea about the time he was the age shown in this photograph. And it's good sometimes to remember where we come from and uh, the people whose ideas we are still trying to work out the consequences of and the fact that there was a time when the best of his life was ahead of him rather than as some of us remember him uh, when it was close to the end. Now, he conceived that idea then around 20, 25 years ago. And as you can quickly learn by consulting the Science Citation Index, which didn't really exist at the time that he had the idea, it was ignored. Even though he mentioned it in his Nobel Prize address, it was ignored. And only in the last few years of this decade did it begin to be noticed in the colloid community. And you see that um, already here we are. Um, this I took off the web, I think, in May or so. We're in a period of exponential growth, which will surely end at some point, but there's no sign yet that it is an, of it ending, of interest in exploring the consequences of these directional interactions. So just to remind you um, of what this is not, um, it is not the interpretation of a, the uh, ideal state of a colloid as being the same in every direction and then crystallizing or forming a glass or doing all the wonderful things that those isotropic interactions can give rise to. Instead, it's the kind of interpretation that we get from looking at the newspapers or thinking about the political interactions with uh, Bangladesh. Um, we know that uh, the world, even though geometrically it's the same in every direction, has very, very complicated direction, uh, differences according to where we are on the globe. And so the question then is, if we were to have globes, spherical in shape, many of them, how might they self-assemble, what structures would they form, and can we find some interesting physics and chemistry and potentially even engineering applications in this. So this has come, this is now named Janus as uh, the, the god of, um, the, that uh, Dijen with his classical uh, education uh, thought of. The the god who looks into the past and into, into the future, who sits in the doorways, looks in both sides of the door, and think of that when you think when you see a janitor come into the room. Okay, but it's a more universal concept than that, and the yin and the yang was quite independent of the European mythology. The Indian. Mythology, half man, half woman, as Muthu Kumar explained to me over breakfast. And you can also have fun. <laughs> okay. This is also something that Kegel, who's here, uh, has become interested in. Um, this phrase, I think, invented by Van Bladeren, that maybe we could have with colloids some useful. Uh, analogies to molecules. So let's consider what would be necessary in order to make give this some substance. And so it would be good to have directional bonding, probably not covalent bonding, instead a more uh, kind of uh, supramolecular, um, non-specific bonding, but still directional. <clears throat> 
And then to achieve that is the need, the need to synthesize such things. How do you put directionality on a sphere? I'll show you how we do it. If one, it's use, if it becomes useful to think of molecules in the colloidal sense, then molecules do have chemical reactivity. There should be some need to implement the notion of chemical reactivity with colloids. And then how would you know if this were the case? Well, look at it in the microscope. It's not that hard. And finally, with molecules, we're accustomed to having, even in a single molecule experiment, that just means that we label one of them and there's a background of lots and lots and lots of others. There should be the capacity of having lots and lots of colloidal molecules, uh, not just a few that you can make and, uh, and uh, take an electron micrograph of and publish or show to your friends with great pride, but actually a substantial number. And so this scale-up problem also uh, turns out to be well within the reach of what people around the world have developed. The way we use uh, to produce the Janus geometry is, is twofold. The best way, the way that produces the most precise configurations, has the disadvantage of producing the least quantity. So sometimes we use that, or sometimes we use another way uh, that allows us to produce uh, much larger quantities, but not quite so well defined in regularity. So the first way is simply to make a monolayer of spheres on a planar surface. So the bottom is protected. Uh, it's against the, the planal, planar surface. And the top is exposed to, let's say, vacuum. And then you can deposit metal, a very thin metal sheet on top of this. It could be gold for some purposes. It could be aluminum for other purposes. Aluminum is less dense than gold. Gold can, is easier to functionalize. So depending on the purpose, we use one or the other. If it's gold, then we can do thiol chemistry on the gold. Um, the other way to produce larger quantities is to simply use emulsions as the template. So one has automatically a very large surface area in a given volume. And uh, the trick then is to, um, it's well known from the uh, notion of what are called pickering emulsions, that colloidal spheres are very prone to adsorb to the oil-water interface. So we allow this to happen. And then before we do chemistry on these particles, when they're sitting at the oil-water interface, we freeze the oil. It's a wax, so we freeze it by lowering the temperature. The particles then no longer rotate. They're fixed in place, and we can do chemistry on either first one side and then the other side and release the particles. So let me walk you now through, this is all, almost going to be a historical um, retrospective of different things we've looked at. In the beginning, for no good reason, it, we had the idea that um, it, we should have particles with no net charge, but one hemisphere positive, the other hemisphere negative, and as well balanced in total charge as was possible. And your initial guess might be that this would be like a magnet. It seems obvious, maybe, that this is dipolar. And therefore, like a magnet, we would form strings. And that idea was wrong, as we thought more about it. And the reason is that when we suspend these particles in water, uh, we have some salt in the water. And so there's screening of the electrostatic interactions. And the Debye length, then, is some number measured in nanometers or so. But the particles have a size that's measured in a micron or two. So this huge mismatch in size means that one side of the, uh, dip of the, of the particle really doesn't know that the other side is charged at all. So what then, what structures might form from such constructs? This led to a wonderful period um, that, uh, of interactions between my friend Eric Lauten, uh, who was doing Monte Carlo simulations, and my student, who was doing experiments. And depending on the day, either my student or 
uh, Eric Blouton's postdoc was ahead. And it would change by the day which one was ahead. So it was great fun. Um, what both Liang, my student, and Angelo Cacciuto, who's now a professor at Columbia University, uh, realized quickly is that this is a more subtle problem than you might at first think. At first, you might say that because we have two hemispheres, uh, either they will attract or they will repel. And so you might at first think there would be a digital uh, interaction, either positive, either attractive or repulsive, and just switching according to uh, between those two states. That's the possibility um, that's shown here on the top panel. But when you stare at that possibility, you realize that it's a very specific and not likely interaction. It, re uh, it requires a very specific alignment uh, of the equators of these two particles. And much more likely would be that the equators are at some canted angle in between. And then according to the details of what is that canted angle, the interaction will have varying degrees of attraction or repulsion and uh, many, many possibilities. Another thing I, I learned from this is how silly I had been in the past when I thought that interactions between particles depended only on distance. So we have a tendency to think that at the same temperature and at the same pressure and the same chemical potential, uh, the interactions between objects simply depend on separation. And this is a wonderful counterexample to that. At the same separation, not only the magnitude, but even the sign of the interaction can switch because the interactions are directional rather than isotropic. So then we embarked on a period of um, experiments that gave fuzzy green images limited by pixelation of cameras and Monte Carlo simulations that gave wonderful detail showing structure. And in every respect that we were, by which we were able to make comparisons, the experiments and the simulations uh, agreed. And uh, with some surprises, actually, um, I thought that because um, when we have these elemental units that are plus and minus, if we put lots of them together into a large cluster, the separation of charge would kind of average out. And in a larger cluster, the, the average charge would be isotropic. But that was wrong. And the computer simulations were able to show very clearly that even for the largest clusters we were able to make, there would be still a, this bipolarity, one side that was predominantly positive and the other predominantly negative. So we were feeling pretty bad. Um, because you see the images are so fuzzy and the simulations are so precise. Um, but what we were able to do, of course, in the experiment is um, have time as part of the problem. And so here's an example of some of the beautiful images uh, that you can take with movies. Uh, this is a kind of flower-like structure, seven-membered cluster you can see how stable the cluster is. Um, there's a seventh particle here that your eyes cannot see that's buried underneath the field of view, and it's absorbed to the bottom of the sample cell. So the cluster is just rotating by Brownian motion. You could imagine giving it a spin, a directional spin, but we didn't try to do that. So we call this the flower structure. Now, there's a problem here because we were not the first to make this such clusters. So David Pine, or Dave Waits's uh, present colleague now, Vinnie Manharan, who was the, uh, the, the student at the time, were making very similar clusters by a very different method of freezing uh, given sp uh, spherical clusters into a given shape and then harvesting them. And most of these small clusters that we made were just the same in structure as they had already produced previously. Some of the larger ones were different, but not all of them. And so then the question became, why bother to make this different kind of assembly by this spontaneous self-assembly route when there were already very good ways to make the same structures other ways? <clears throat> 
So that led us um, to thinking about a different kind of motif for the interactions, something a little bit like a soap molecule in the sense that part of the particle would be uh, hydrophobic and the other would be charged. And so there would be hydrophobic attraction between hydrophobic patches and electrostatic repulsion between the polar patches of these particles. It could be a half-half geometry or just as in soap molecules, you can vary the hydrophobic, hydrophilic balance. Here, too, you can vary the area of the hydrophobic patch. So one thing we started, we began doing, and this is now a different student, and you can start to see the personality of different students being displayed in different types of results. So the previous student was extremely creative and just like a cook going into the kitchen and making different dishes, he would go into the lab and make different structures. She's more methodical and also very clever, and so she just started out designing structures. So she decided in the beginning to design a monodispersed structure, something that would self-assemble into only one shape and not a whole distribution of shapes as had been done in the past. And to her, it then was obvious that the way to approach that was to have a small hydrophobic patch. So um, there's a certain um, latitude um, that, um, that generates this. It has to be large enough for neighboring spheres to come close enough together to uh, experience the hydrophobic attraction, but small enough to prevent larger, to, to prevent uh, degeneracy of different structures. And she noticed also that the electrostatic repulsion here on the white portion of the sphere is actually a helpful thing because it, uh, it, prevents, uh, it, it prevents the, the um, uh, too many neighbors. So here's an example of um, tetrahedra that form spontaneously in extremely monodispersed form. You're watching this uh, just moving around by Brownian motion in the jerky way the computer um, can follow. And she quantified this. She saw there's still some abundance of, um, <coughs> of monomers. Uh, there were some imperfections in our preparation, so it was not pure tetrahedral. But about 80% of the sample was self-assembled tetrahedra. OK. Now, that was for small hydrophobic patches. Uh, now let's make them bigger and allow some degeneracy of the structure and allow larger structures to grow than four elemental units. Now it's going to depend, what is possible will depend on the salt concentration because if the salt concentration is very low, then the screening length is very large and only if spheres can come close together, it's only by having the charged portions avoid one another and being on opposite sides of, of, of a doublet. But as the screening becomes larger, then the charged portions don't feel one another over a larger and larger latitude of angles, and different angles of orientation become possible. So as you raise the concentration of the salt, you raise the, 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 uh, the range of angles that are possible, and you allow the insertion of additional particles into the, what's displayed here, which is only doublets. And here's an example of what you can find. It looks a bit like some diagram you might find in organic chemistry of different reactions, backwards and forwards, because these are reversible interactions, um, different numbers of particles participating, different shapes uh, being assembled. And all of the structures here, these are not just dreamed up and imagined. These are actually, everything on this page actually has been observed. Um, and the student uh, drew this after she observed them. OK, so here's just an example of how alive they are and how the chemistry, I'm, let me call it chemistry, takes place. Here they are, small clusters coming together by Brownian motion. And when they do come together, it's more stable to form a larger cluster. And so here it is, uh, self-assembled, and a little piece fell off. And with time, 
because it is a reversible interaction and only about 10 kT per particle, per, per pair of particles, there's a chance that some other part, that it will fall apart. Okay. So then we have um, a revisitation of the small clusters that you saw earlier and that had also been made uh, by the Pine method. Uh, in the earlier um, set of experiments, we had the idea that for every number of particles in the cluster, there would be a given definite shape. And that's true except for the larger clusters. So for the larger clusters, um, the same number of particles, six or seven, can take two isomeric shapes, and then, of course, all the pathways of intermediate shapes that allow the interconversion between those structures. And these are well known, I think, in the, in the gas phase cluster community and have been simulated there. But remember here, it's not from the isotropic interactions. It's from this very directional interaction that they form. So these isomers um, are not frozen, but they're, um, they are mobile. You could call them fluid. And um, they convert from one to another uh, with time. And kinetics actually makes a big, um, you know, is, is an essential part of this problem. Because one of the isomers is kinetically favored. And the other isomer is thermodynamically, we believe, favored. So time really matters. One of them forms first and then interconverts with time. And it's a, if you have patience to stare at movies like this, you can follow the pathway of interconversion, watching how the particles inter, uh, rearrange uh, by sliding one particle at a time, by sliding two particles at a time, and not shown here in these cartoons, their vibrations as well, and very complicated normal modes. And so pursuing this idea of molecular colloids, there's really a lot to do um, that has not been done where you look one by one at given clusters, not without any ensemble averaging necessary, to look at the pathways of interconversion between different structures. So what do we learn? Um, we can have different clusters, different assemblies, with the same number of particles, enthalpically are identical. The difference is the entropy. The ways to count that entropy are not so obvious. Um, you can enumerate possibilities, rotation, vibration, bending for the larger ones. But to actually quantify these influences um, um, appears to be quite a hard problem. So it's quite rich. OK, so now let's go back to the experiment. You, you begin with these Janus half-half particles, which are hydrophobic on one side and charged on the other, and a given ionic strength that allows uh, clusters to form um, in abundance. You very carefully um, seek to equilibrate. You find that there's a distribution between different cluster sizes. Uh, you find, put yourself in that uh, regime of equilibration you realize that even uh, though the cluster size may have equilibrated, the cluster structure would not have. And you can follow now the isomerization from one structure to the other. It seems to be follow a very simple chemical reaction kinetics. So again, the analogy to molecular colloids is, is holding up in this sense. It's a first order reaction. Um, and now come some surprises that you can understand, but we certainly had not anticipated it. As you raise the salt concentration, or you raise the particle concentration at a given salt concentration, small clusters can become big. Now, they can't become big in every direction at once because they're charged on one side. The only way they can grow is like a small molecule surfactant would grow, by uh, having a hydrophobic core and elongating then. And what happens then as you have a hydrophobic core composed of spheres is that helices will form, very beautiful helices. There's no preference for either chirality, they're racemic, 
you could imagine perhaps by sheer by select to select a given chirality, but here where everything is quiescent, there's no preference. And now let's try to think why this given structure that you saw in the, in the experiment is selected over others. And there's a nice analogy to graphene. So some of you may know that these uh, three, uh, these, these carbon uh, atoms with three neighbors can be rolled up into carbon nanotubes of wonderfully different structures, just depending on the angle with which you roll them up. And now it's not the same for these particles. Our particles actually have six neighbors. So unlike the isotropic interactions that allow 12 neighbors, these allow only six because of the, uh, the, the, the hemispherical attraction. But um, that six neighbor interaction could be satisfied in many ways. And this was discovered long ago uh, when people were trying to make sense of the tubular forms of biological molecules that were observed. And they were trying to understand why a given helix, helix was preferred over another helix. All of these, in principle, could be formed by our Janus amphiphilic particles. But in fact, we see only one of them. So why do we see only that one, two, three helix? Um, we went back into a very enjoyable collaboration with, uh, with my friend Eric Lauten who computed as best he could the relative stability of these different helical structures. Now remember that enthalpically they're the same. And the only reason that the, for these differences, uh, the x-axis, by the way, is the size of the hydrophobic patch. So worry only about the 90 degree one, which means hemispherical. The only difference between these different structures comes from the entropy terms, which I told you a moment ago are very hard to calculate. So what he put into these calculations are uh, a certain amount of, uh, of vibrations. Uh, we know that other elements are not there. But what you learn already is that the numbers are pretty close. And so we would have expected if everything formed simply from energy uh, to find a big distribution of structures, but we don't. And that, we think, has to do with the fact that kinetics limits the structures we form. So here's an example, um, if the computer allows us to see it, of the dynamic aspect here. Oh, no. I hope it hasn't frozen up. computer thinks it's running. Too many movies. So please be patient. Shall we stop for questions while the computer decides what to do? Entropy when you form helices. I mean, uh, uh, don't you pay a price in entropy? By, by, by forming larger clusters? I, um, there's a big chain, there's a big advantage of enthalpy. So the amount, it, it's very advantageous to, to add more particles. That's my understanding of it. The, so the, my understanding is that the, the bigger the cluster, the more enthalpically favored it is. Right. By, you pay price in yeah, right, but you pay a price in entropy. Yeah, but so, you pay some price in entropy. Yeah, so, so there, is a, there must be a balance. Yeah. They're still very sluggish. But what the movie would show you is that uh, these two helices move around by Brownian motion. Um, they just nudge the ends. By chance, the, the ends would come together. The spheres are mobile here. They're not stuck in place, but they're reorienting by Brownian motion. And so this adventitious reorientation would allow the two ends to fuse. And what started as two discrete helices that you see 
then becomes one helix that, that takes on a life of its own. Okay. So we're, what we learn from this is that chirality from something with no chirality uh, is known in other fields of chemistry and physics and shows up in, our, in this field of colloids as well. And the structure appears to be selected by kinetics, by the particular isomeric form uh, that forms at early times, then polymerizing into this particular helix that we see and not a particular other one, which the computer simulations tell us we should have seen. Um, now these one, two, three helices that I won't try to pronounce, it's, uh, can somebody from the Netherlands tell me how to pronounce it? Verdicoxeter, how do you say it? You'll tell us later. <laughs> okay, so these simulations have shown, and, and even some experiments with isotropic interactions, this structure can form uh, at low concentrations. But the problem is that with isotropic interactions, there's no reason to maintain the elongated shape. In this case, um, because the helices are charged on the outsides, there is no way for them to branch as the isotropic interactions would allow. And you can concentrate them to very large uh, volume fractions. OK. So colloids can have a directional bonding. And in the sense of not covalent bonding, but reversible, reversible self-assembly, you can form supracolloidal, supramolecular structures. And between the extremes of discrete particles or crystallinity and glass, um, there is this interesting intermediate state of matter called clusters that's very well behaved. Now, another way in which one can interpret this Janus motif is to um, maintain the isotropic interactions. And the way you do that is by when you form Remember I told you you can form particles by, um, by coating one hemisphere with a metal. On top of the metal, you can coat another layer, which makes it the same chemically as on the bottom. But because there, there's metal on one hemisphere, it's opaque on that hemisphere. So then you have something whose interactions are isotropic, but look a bit like the moons in the sky. And why be satisfied with just one moon? Here you can have as many as you have patience to make. And so think of the students in the laboratory working in a dark room with the lights out, taking movies, and they construct their own night skies. So this idea of moons was pioneered uh, not by us, but by Raoul Kopelman at Michigan. And what you can do now is um, think about the not just the two dimensions um, of x and y, or z, as Dave told us, but also about the spin of particles. And so you can see here a dilute suspension just moving around in the conventional way by Brownian motion. But what your eyes see also is the Brownian rotation as well. And we worked very hard to quantify that. Um, it it's now done. It works. Um, it was a lot of work, not by me, but by a very talented student. And so one can go on then and um, quantify the Brownian rotation um, with really a lot of um, precision in the measurement. And ask questions of hydrodynamics, for example. Um, for example, let's say we have just two particles moving past one another. So you would say, if we think as shown here, one particle translates. There, it, even though it's not touching the particle underneath it, there is water in between. And so your intuition might say that it would tend to cause some rotation of the particle underneath. And what experiments will tell you is that that's true. And actually, it extends a long distance. Uh, for a distance of uh, roughly two or a little bit more uh, uh, than two particle radii, we can observe this correlation between the, dis the rotation of one particle 
induced by the local translation of another one. Or similarly, you might say, what about if the one rotates? Might it not induce a counter spin of a neighboring particle? And the answer is yes. And the effect, again, is not that large, but it is measurable. And certainly for a separation of one particle radius, and perhaps a little bit more than that, it's big enough to measure. So it's just like playing pool, playing with balls of with marbles, <coughs> except these are Brownian particles. And so it's an aspect of Brownian motion that's interesting to consider. Now, let's think about these, let's go back to the asymmetric, chemically asymmetric particles, which are hydrophobic on one side and, hydrophil and uh, charged on the other. And let's make mono monolayers of them and think about the structure that they will form, okay, and the patterns that might then form. So again, we have the hydrophobic attraction, we have the electrostatic repulsion, and to keep things simple and to keep things easy to, to, um, to observe in a microscope, we will limit ourselves to just a monolayer. And we will observe patterns like this that we want to understand. So what your eyes here are seeing black and white. That's telling you that the metal parts of these hemispheres, the, the metal coated hemisphere and the other hemisphere that's not coated by metal are standing perpendicular to the sample cell. And the metal part is hydrophobic. The metal pieces are coming together, are attracting one another by the hydrophobic interactions. And there are long range patterns that are very obvious to our eyes. Uh, if the computer allows, you can see that it is alive. Um, these are not patterns frozen in space, but they're moving around, they're rearranging. And you're going to see in a moment, this is a peculiar kind of crystal. It is a crystal. Um, the positions of these particles are very boring. It's just hexagonal close packing in, at, of the kind that, um, that you would see with, with, with balls. Um, but there's this orientational order that is changing with time and which is very fluid. And so we have something, just as we know with, with our watches, we have liquid crystals. Here we have one type of positional order and a different orientational order, and they're in different states of order. And the orientation is liquid or perhaps glassy. Okay, so how would this, what would be the nature of this or order? You might have thought that it would be just bilayers, but it's not. And that's because of the orientational freedom to uh, the spheres uh, can attract in different ways. And so you can see rhombuses here form. Uh, you know, the way to imagine the, the unit cell is to think of uh, assemblies of four particles coming together to satisfy their hydrophobic attraction by that way. The positional order, I told you, is very boring. And the way to see that is to take uh, a Fourier transform of an optical image, and it will show you simply that um, there's nothing interesting. There's long-range positional order that you can get much more easily without complicated particles like this. But we have the orientations. We think we know what the ground state is. Um, on panel A here, you see the rhombuses, the same ones as before. You can express this in different languages. There's a community of physicists that likes to talk about spins. The way to think of it that way is to draw an arrow across the hemispheres from one to the other, and then think of how spins interact. So that's one way to represent this, and the numbers there in the spin representation are simply giving numbers to different particles. The rhombuses can be, sta can be uh, perfectly aligned, they can uh, point in counter-parallel uh, directions. They can be displaced with respect to one another. There are many possibilities. So there are a lot of degeneracies in this thing. And one can make interesting analyses. Um, it's actually much 
easier to do experiments than to analyze the data. That to analyze the data takes much longer than to do the experiments. So for example, one can look at the angular correlation in different directions um, of these particles. And there's some, um, of, of course, because this is a hydrophobic, because particles face one another when they attract, there's some um, uh, negative interaction. Um, so the first nearest neighbor is pointed in the opposite direction. But then the next one is pointed in the same direction. And you see a decay length for this interaction. The decay length depends on salt concentration because the repulsion uh, 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 between the polar parts uh, matters. And there's some distance here, decay length, that increases pretty rapidly with small increases in the salt concentration. In the movie a moment ago, you saw that uh, the structure was flickering with time and changing from one, uh, from one structure to the other with time. This you can quantify very carefully at different concentrations of salt. That's what the numbers here next to each graph, uh, each point, each line show. These are very well described by language that's familiar when one thinks about liquids or supercooled liquids or glasses. Uh, they're not single exponentials, but they can be described as stretched exponentials. And a very surprising thing is that um, the stretching exponents are very familiar from the field of glasses. So there's um, they, uh, the, the limiting, the smallest one we see is about one third, is about 0 0.3, and it grows monotonically uh, from that. One advantage of this kind of structure compared to other kinds of systems where it's well known that you can have that stretched exponential uh, decay is that you can begin to inquire into where it comes from. Because all this is happening in the microscope, we don't have to guess about different local environments. We can just take a look at the different local environments and we can quantify how separate separate uh, ways of describing the local microenvironments rearrange at different rates. So here are four different ways of describing what those local environments are. You can see that one of them um, is much more quick to rearrange than the other, than the other fours, other four. Um, so again, this is kind of exciting that you can uh, have this very quantitative way of dissecting what the order, the different contributions to non-exponential uh, time dependence. And finally, just almost for fun, think of how the motion of one particle correlates to the motion of neighboring particles, just like, well, we don't have watches anymore, but um, students here have read about watches, right? Um, <laughs> And you know that when one wheel turns, another wheel nearby also counter-rotates. And here it will be literally the same as well. And we can follow this. So you can see there's some small wiggles of um, just Brownian motion of a given particle. And then, but they're correlated. When one, one, when one moves, the one nearby has to move in the opposite sense. And then the third one similarly has to move in response and there's this cascade effect. So this has been a survey of different things one can do with a very simple motif of simply putting two patches onto one particle. Now on a computer you can put many more patches on. Uh, in a laboratory it's not so easy. So um, there are surprises. Uh, nothing that one cannot understand after observing it. But I think there's a good lesson to see that before one observes it, one simply hadn't known where to look. And I'm sure there are other places to look that we haven't, nobody's thought of yet. So let me tell you who really did this. Um, here's Eric Lauten. Um, it was begun by the guy who graduated, Shan Jiang, um, who graduated a year ago. He decided to become a, a nanomedicine guy. So he's a postdoc with, uh, with Lang someone called Langer at MIT. Um, Stephen Anthony is the one who found the ways to quantify all this on the computer. It's really hard. And the people doing it now, um, Chen Chen, uh, 
um, is the one whose mathematical mind was, uh, was behind almost everything I told you today. Jing Yan is very interesting. He's a chemist. He's a synthetic chemist who, as an undergraduate, had about 10 papers, all of them synthesizing different molecules. Okay, so with that kind of spirit of inquiry and enthusiasm, he decided that was enough chemistry, uh, no more. And uh, he's only his first-year student, and it was his chemist's mind that did all this correlation analysis of the two-dimensional crystal. So he taught himself all this language of, of physics um, and, uh, and made it his own and extended it to these colloidal systems. So thank you for your attention. One of the graphs you had uh, uh, shown the cluster size of 4, 5 is uh, dominating, if I'm correct. So same uh, in my, uh, when I had worked also same thing and I had also observed. So can you comment on why that, uh, uh, that pattern uh, actually dominating? Why 4 dominates? 4, four five, I hope so. 4 does not dominate ah. unless the patch size is small. Ah. If the patch is 50-50, then larger clusters grow and eventually the helical patterns that I showed to you. Uh -huh. But. <laughs> we'll do this one. Okay. Hi. It's a, it's a very beautiful talk. Um, I have a question which is a little bit related to the last question. You can control four, but do you control any other structures? No. And it looked to me like what you get when you try to change the interactions is actually more or less the same as the hard spheres with it for the small clusters. Is that right? So up to about we, 10 or so, it's just... The, the, up to about 10, it's, it's about the same. Yeah. Okay. Um, there are differences. The, you know, which isomeric form we get, we can actually control um, by varying the salt concentration. But, um, but different isomeric forms are observed with hard spheres um, with the depletion interaction to, to bring them together. Um, there's, these, of course, are stable at high concentration, um, because they repel one another. If you have the um, depletion interaction forming the clusters, then there's no reason for them to stop at a small cluster. They, they're just as happy to form you know, macroscopic-sized aggregates. So there's a really essential difference between the, the approaches. Um, the only way to maintain smaller clusters with an isotropic interaction is to uh, isolate them from one another. <coughs> But, um, but if you look one by one, they're very similar. The, the details of vibration and normal modes and so on, I'm sure, would be different. Uh, same here. I really enjoyed your talk, Steve. Thank um, you. I have a question about, because you were kind of, um, I think, worried about the only 8% uh, tetrahedral um, particles that or, or clusters that that appeared, yeah. uh, but but I think if it if it's an equilibrium, that's that's what you expect, right? Yeah, yeah. Because the, the monomers are just the, the, the there has to be an equilibrium between monomers and and assembly. Yes, exactly. So the, yeah. related to that, do you also see these monomers around uh, in the in these helices in these helices? We always see some monomers. Um, yes, um, and it, because it is a reversible interaction. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Steve. Which this, uh, these type of crystals do form, or uh, they is there something like a CMC yeah. in this system? Um, I would love to know the answer. Um. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but well, okay. So maybe you can answer this in a more intelligent way than I can. Um, <laughs> when I. When we take small, very small concentrations, of course, we can prevent clusters. But there's always the question, maybe it's just because um, the particles didn't 
didn't encounter one another and it was kinetically limited. And so if we waited long enough for them to find one another, wouldn't they have a tendency to aggregate? I, I, I cannot answer that. No, but I think in any uh, clustering equilibrium, there's always a critical concentration below which there are no... The hydrophobic and the hydrophilic ba balance between the... Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so very... As you saw in the calculations that I didn't explain in great detail, the relative stability of the different helical forms actually shifted with the hydrophobic hydrophilic balance. Looking at Janus particles, at dimer or two two sided particles, yeah, um, and you you did all this you know, really wonderful analysis, experimental, and mm. uh, uh, trying to track things. And in some sense, you think of that maybe as some particles with a spin or something like that. So there's two states. Yeah. What happens when you go to multi-state, which you said is much more difficult to make, but yeah. maybe some people can do it. Are there going to be qualitative differences or quantitative differences? I think there will be qualitative differences. And there will be um, there are two ways to approach that problem. Um, so with computer simulations, different people have put very complicated um, sites on, on objects, and you can sort of emulate the notion of covalent interactions and, and form all kinds of structures um, um, in almost a building black way. I don't know whether experiments are going to be able to do that because the synthesis of the, the, the requirements to synthesize that are just too hard. Um, you can imagine other ways to form different blocks, more than just two blocks, and we're, we're doing that sort of experiment, but it's, it's just too soon to know. These finite uh, uh, clusters, um, I mean, are, are there sort of desirable target structures that people want to make? And, and, and uh, where are you with respect to sort of being able to do that? Is there a nanomedicine application to... <laughs> to release drugs or something. No, right now we're just following our curiosity. That's all. Um, there's no direction. It's all about directional interactions except in the research. It's <laughs> Steve, uh, I, I missed it. What, what did you put on this to make the charge and the hydrophobic? Uh, what, what? Oh, it's just too stupid. Uh, that's why I didn't tell you. It's, it's, um, it's too elementary. Um, the particles come charged for free. Right, you 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 buy the best particles you can, latex particles or silica, depending on which experiment. So they're they're charged, and then after you coat your other side to be hydrophobic, then there you are. Any other questions? If not, let's thank uh, Steve. For yeah. a great